This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Charles Kessler talks about his book, Crisis of the Two Constitutions, The Rise, Decline, and Recovery of American Greatness. The Claremont Review of Books editor argues that there are two competing views of the U.S. Constitution. He's interviewed by Georgia Mason University law professor Ilya Solman. My name is Ilya Selman. I'm here with Charles Kessler to talk about his important new book, The Crisis of the Two Constitutions. Uh, and I think maybe I'll start off with a very simple question, which is, what are the two constitutions and in what sense are they in crisis? Like, what, what is the problem uh, that they're facing? Well, um, uh, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here, Ilya, and thank you for the uh, invitation to Book TV uh, as well. Um, the two constitutions are the original constitution, <clears throat> what I call the founder's constitution, um, rooted in the natural rights doctrines uh, of the Declaration of Independence and, of course, um, amended almost immediately and amended many times um, since then after it was promulgated in 1787, 88. Um, but that's a constitution of natural rights, um, limited government, uh, separation of powers, the traditional constitutional structures and principles um, that um, American history discloses to us, I guess you could say. Um, and the other constitution, it, the competing constitution, is the what I call the progressives constitution. This goes by the name sometimes of the living constitution. This is a term that Woodrow Wilson uh, began to use a uh, hundred years ago, and that many other progressives, uh, and especially uh, people in, in your field, jurisprudence, uh, <clears throat> have um, uh, adopted. Um, but the living constitution implies uh, none too subtly that the, uh, that the alternative is a dead constitution, uh, or at least is a constitution that's on life support. And um, the living constitution, the progressive constitution, is a constitution of um, evolutionary rights, uh, essentially group-based and, uh, and you could say um, hi historically based rights, which uh, emphasizes the need for all constitutional structures to be mutable, to be changeable, adaptable, and therefore uh, for the government to go into the business of experimenting in a way on the American people to try to cure their latest social and economic uh, distresses. And the problem with, the, with having two constitutions in one country, <laughs> of course, is that that's one too many, <clears throat> that they, um, um, they conflict increasingly. And the polarization of our politics, the deepening divisions in our politics, I think, are connected to the, these underlying political and philosophical um, differences. It's gotten worse as time has gone by, uh, as, the, as the progressive constitution has become more progressive, um, and in a way as the, um, as the conservatives, the other faction in our party, has become uh, more conservative, more um, conscious of what's at stake, what's, at, what's in peril, and, uh, and of, their, of their duty to try to preserve it. And so that's in simple form, th those are the two competing um, constitutions which are um, dominating our political life right now. So that, that's a great summary of it. I think we're gonna return to the progressive constitution soon enough, but I wanted sure. to talk with you about your view of what the original constitution or the conservative constitution means because for a lot of originalist constitutional theorists, both conservative and otherwise, what they mean when they talk about the original constitution is something like the original understanding of the text as of the time of enactment. Some would say it's the original understanding by the general public at the time. Others might say it's the understanding by a community of legal experts, lawyers, judges, uh, other people of that sort. Uh, and if one of them were to write a book like this, some actually have written books about this topic, they would probably go into some detail about what is the true scope of federal power under the original meaning, what is the meaning of various individual rights. In your book, it's possible I've misunderstood, but in your book, there actually isn't a lot of 
exegesis of that type. Uh, it's, it may be that what you mean by the original meaning is something more like the original principles or the original understanding of natural law. So I wonder uh, if you could talk a bit more about what you mean, what you mean by the original meaning and how perhaps it might be different from that offered by uh, other constitutional theorists, particularly constitutional theorists on the right who think of themselves as, as originalists. Because certainly your book, both in tone and content, has a lot of differences in terms of its focus, at least from many of the books that I'm familiar with by originalists, or at least people who would think of themselves as originalists. Yes. No, I think you're right. Um, uh, that argument between, you know, uh, uh, originalism and, uh, and whatever, what, whatever the opposite of originalism is now, I know there's liberal originalism as well as conservative originalism. It's a, it's a, it's a fascinating field. And that, those arguments are, are well developed. I mean, that, that ground is fairly well trodden. So what I tried to do in this book was to look, you might say, at the general political principles behind the, um, the, the Republican government that Americans created for themselves beginning in the 1770s and accelerating, of course, with the um, uh, replacement of the Articles of Confederation by the Constitution in the 1780s, and you could say into the 1790s with the Bill of Rights. Um, so I'm interested, uh, I'm not interested so much in the question of how a judge would interpret the text, <clears throat> which leads to all sorts of interesting questions that, um, and debates that uh, Judge Bork and uh, Justice Scalia and others have had with Harry Jaffa and various um, uh, other political theorists <clears throat> on the question of whether um, the judge's job is uh, comprehensive in a certain way. I mean, is he supposed to, uh, is, he, is he a one-stop shop for justice uh, or is his job much more constrained than that? And that's an interesting debate, but it's not the one that I'm staging or you know, looking into in this, in this book. I'm more interested in what did the writers and the generation that um, ratified the Constitution and the whole series of constitutional settlements along the way, beginning with the state constitutions, the new state constitutions uh, written in the 1770s, uh, and of course the Declaration itself, uh, and include and going up to and including the Bill of Rights, uh, and and maybe even slightly farther uh, beyond that. But I think there's a kind of unity in the moral, political um, ideas of that generation, broadly speaking, uh, that is reflected in the documents and in the text uh, of the documents and certainly in the arguments uh, of the documents. So I'm uh, taking a more um, latitudinarian point of view than the judge's point of view. I'm, I'm trying to take the citizen's point of view, you might say, or the statesman's point of view, where you're actually concerned with giving the law and not simply interpreting it once it has been given. Um, they're parts of the same process in a way. But um, um, what I'm concerned with is in a way the, uh, the moral and political presumptions of Republican government um, in America as it worked itself out. And how <clears throat> quite remarkably um, in the last uh, 100 plus years, a, a kind of counter theory has been developed <clears throat> by Woodrow Wilson, by the progressive generation, and, and by generations of liberals and progressives ever since. And I don't think the story really is known well uh, of just how high, how high the contrast is between the political theory of the two, um, of the two constitutions. And I think it's, it's important to understand it how high the contrast is, how high the, dis the level of disagreement is, um, in order to see why our politics has taken the uh, direction that it has taken, uh, especially in the last 50 years, let's say. So I think it's entirely fair to say that you're not taking the judge's perspective 
and that even the judge's perspective is certainly not the only one or even necessarily the most important one. There may be a more fundamental level of perspective you can have. Nonetheless, I would like to press you a little bit more on this point in that uh, because for entirely reasonably you focus on these broad general principles, it's often not entirely clear to me, at least in my reading of the book, uh, how these principles would shake out, not just in terms of very specific cases, like should Smith defeat Jones in this particular lawsuit, but even on such broad things as is under your conception of the original constitution, for instance, is all or most of the New Deal constitutional or is it not? You can ask a similar question about the Great Society, about a good many regulatory programs as well. I understand, I think, your point that even if you would say many of these programs are constitutional, there is still this deep theoretical difference between you on the one hand uh, and certainly uh, progressive constitutionalists, but even perhaps some conservative ones as well. But if it turns out that most of the institutions they think are constitutional are, uh, are all, uh, on their conception are also constitutional on yours, uh, and you're fighting over them sort of more marginal cases than even if mm -hmm. at a theoretical <laughs> level you still have a deep disagreement, at a practical level the crisis may be a bit less great than at least at some parts of your book you suggest, uh, in, in that on the other hand, if like some uh, conservative or libertarian originalists, you think a high proportion of the New Deal, the Great Society, the administrative state, modern regulatory programs, if you think a high proportion of that is unconstitutional and they obviously think it's just fine and indeed in many cases they would say we need more of it, um, then the, the difference is greater. So I'm not asking you, you know, how would you decide every single case, uh, um, but I, I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about sort of the implications of your view of the original constitution for sort of these big major institutions that have arisen uh, over the last century. Well, I take it, you know, I'm, I'm impressed by the fact that um, uh, thinkers, uh, jurists, but also statesmen um, from all parts of the political spectrum at the end of the 19th century and, and in the beginning of the 20th century were impressed by the change in conditions of American economic and social life. Um, you can find, you know, Elihu Root and um, uh, uh, many, you know, uh, William Howard Taft and other uh, Republican uh, conservatives, if you want to call them that, a conservative progressives, really, in a way, um, <clears throat> who, who say the same thing that Woodrow Wilson and Teddy Roosevelt say, which is that some, uh, some political changes and perhaps constitutional changes may be necessary in order to handle the new conditions of um, large scale enterprise and uh, international commerce and uh, large, even large scale immigration, the social as well as the economic side of the, uh, of the new conditions of America at the end of the, uh, you know, at the beginning of the, of the machine age and of the electric age and of the, the, the new technologies that are changing the world. Um, and, and there's something to that. I think uh, there is a reformist generation uh, in the Republican Party and in the Democratic Party, more so in the Republican Party actually than in the Democrat, Democratic Party in those days, um, who are trying to figure out whether wages and hours laws are going to be needed, and if so, I mean, are they constitutional? How can they be kept constitutional? How can regulation, <clears throat> antitrust regulation, and other kinds uh, also be um, squared with the, a constitutional system that lacked such things for its first, you know, 100 and some, 125 years uh, or so? Um, and I'm sympathetic to the attempt to, to figure out what marginal changes can be made uh, that address the real problems of the of the age, um, but don't do um, permanent or extensive constitutional damage um, along the way. And that is, a, in a way, that was the debate that was going on in the first couple of decades of the 20th century among, um, not just among well, among progressives, but almost everyone was in some sense a kind of progressive <laughs> in those days. Um, but I think that that's um, uh, the right question to ask. 
without changing constitutional fundamentals, what reforms could usefully be made um, to national, the national regulatory apparatus um, of the country. And they were feeling their way forward. Um, what I what I focus on in the book really is the um, is this is not the the fight at the margins over what can be done and what should be done, um, but rather the wholesale change in ideas underlying the whole debate, which was moving the debate away from a debate you know uh, which assumed the existence of certain constitutional fundamentals and then ask. So what can we do given the separation of powers, given federalism and so forth? Um, but rather a, a, a new spirit, uh, the, which Wilson called the new freedom, which was a freedom from the old constitutional arrangements and from the assumptions of the old constitutional system so that he could launch um, in, in theory, a kind of searching uh, examination and rejection of the whole notion of separation of powers as a constitutional requirement, um, as a moral and political requirement. And once you make that move, once you have shifted from a debate about what is uh, marginally possible to what is fundamentally possible, what is actually um, in the nature of good government, you know, what what is dictated by the nature of good government, um, then you really have, it seems to me, set up not a, uh, a dispute about a, um, an adjustment of the, of the Constitution to new circumstances, but rather a choice between two constitutions, uh, which increasingly are pulling in different directions. I, I certainly take the point that there is a distinction between uh, what is a marginal and a fundamental change, though what is marginal for some people uh, may well be fundamental for others. So, uh, for instance, from your book, it's not entirely clear to me whether you think something like Social Security or a nationwide minimum wage, whether that's just a marginal adjustment to new economic conditions or whether it's a fundamental change. I personally think it's a fundamental change, but you, know, yes. you, you, you may differ. No, well, it's a good question because it, I mean, it's clear that from the point of view of, uh, you know, of, of many of the justices and many very intelligent people, it is unconstitutional. These things were not simply innovations uh, at the margins, but they, they raised new kinds of moral claims and new kinds of rights that had a tendency to crowd out the older form of property rights, the older form of personal liberty rights to some extent. Um, and I recognize that. And I would say in, in theory, I'm, I uh, agree with the argument that this is a um, um, an, a, a, a constitutional innovation. Um, I think as a looking at it, however, not simply from, and this is part of the complications of that period, um, the, when you have super majorities, um, passing, um, all kinds of these, uh, uh, new deal programs, let's say, um, you have a, um, a, a practical political, uh, problem, which is, uh, one that the Republican party found itself in very quickly and <laughs> ever since has found itself in, um, I would say as a, uh, as a um, practical political uh, matter, um, some of these are more unconstitutional than others, uh, and practically resistance should be, you know, should be concentrated on the worst of them, and rolling back what can in fact be rolled back. Um, sometimes uh, the what might be they would dismiss as constitutional fundamentalism um, gets in the way of um, uh, practical democratic politics and improvement. Um, but uh, I, I would say, you know, 
it's a little late in the day now <laughs> to expect the Supreme Court to overturn Social Security or any of the other, um, or not, maybe not any of the other, but most of the other um, social welfare innovations, the new kinds of socioeconomic rights that have been vouchsafed into our politics by um, um, uh, usually not the courts, but by Congress uh, over the course of the last hundred years. I mean, it's part of the problem of the two constitutions <clears throat> that neither one is going to go away immediately or <laughs> anytime soon. And therefore there's a, a high level of, of um, conflict and contradiction in the constitutional system as a whole. That's fair. I would simply note that depending on how much of this stuff you're willing to accept, it may be the difference between yeah. you and at least many of the progressives could be smaller than meets the eye, at least in terms of what institutions or what program you're willing to accept, even though you may have different reasons for accepting them than they do. Uh, but I wanted to ask a different sort of more fundamental question about the original constitution, if you will, and in deference to your, I think, very important and valid interest in the fundamentals. And that is sort of what is the, I take it, I think your view is that we should be at least as much as possible following the original constitution rather than the progressive constitution or perhaps even certain conservative alternatives to it. So I guess my question is, what is the sort of normative ground why we should do that? Because in the book, I detect at least three different possible answers. One is the sort of the theory of unanimous consent that you talk about in your discussion of the Declaration of Independence and the framers that, you know, this is what was consented to. That might be a valid ground, but it has the problem that, as you know, there was not, in fact, unanimous consent to the revolution. There were lots of loyalists uh, who didn't consent, very emphatically so, and obviously slaves did not have the opportunity to consent. There wasn't the unanimous consent to uh, the, the Constitution either. And I don't think there's been anything like unanimous consent at any point in American history. So another possibility, and this too I see, at least in my interpretation, correct me if I'm wrong, but another possibility that I think I can derive from your book is that the original constitution should be followed not because necessarily people consented to it, but because it's based on the right moral principles. So even if people don't agree on those principles, they don't recognize how right they are, they still have a duty to follow it because that's that's just the truth, uh, perhaps even the truth with a capital T, but at least with a lowercase one. Um, then a final possibility, which may not be fully mutually exclusive, at least with the second one is, and here, you know, I advert to your discussions in parts of the book about prudence and statesmanship and the like that maybe the institutions of the original constitution properly interpreted are just better for the pragmatic solving of social problems or the pragmatic evolution of society than would be the living constitution. And you talk a lot about prudential statesmanship, both when you talk about the founders and when you discuss Abraham Lincoln, and part of your critique in some places, at least, of progressives is that I think, I believe you think they're imprudent. Uh, they're overly optimistic about how flexible human nature is. Uh, at one point, you also condemn them for not considering long-term fiscal problems uh, and the like. So uh, I wonder, is it one of those three theories, which is the truly fundamental one for you? Is it some combination of all three? And perhaps what happens if they conflict? Like, what if there is a constitution? What if it turns out that the original constitution doesn't enjoy anything even remotely close to unanimous consent, but maybe it's still pragmatically desirable, or maybe it's still based on the right moral principles, uh, but con or conversely, maybe it's pragmatically desirable, but maybe it gets certain important moral principles wrong in some way. Uh, so I wonder if you could expand on those you know, those fundamentals, uh, if you will. And if I've misinterpreted you, please feel free to point out how I've done so. Um, no, I would say uh, it's, not, <clears throat> it's not because the principles of, of political justice in the founding are correct, although I think they are uh, correct. But it's not simply that they're correct that gives them authority over a, a particular, any particular people including the people of the United States. Um, that is a question of consent. Uh, 
Um, now it, it is, you know, under the, under social contract theory, there there is a stage, so to speak, of unanimous consent, but that's really only at the at the formation of a country, a civil society that is going to be, one, you know, uh, uh, joined together as one. Um, what you know, what law, form, what the actual form of government is going to be, what the laws are going to be of that country, that's a separate stage of consent in classical theory, at least, a second stage of consent, which is, um, you know, in, in which majority consent is the most practical and most moral um, uh, principle of legitimation. Um, and that's, you know, standard contract theory of, of the sort that is extremely common in the American founding and uh, before and afterwards. So it, it not the fact that not everyone uh, consented, um, which um, uh, of course is true at several levels, um, it, that isn't disabling, it seems to me. As long as the majority of the society is, uh, is consenting and as long as um, the losing side accepts the verdict um, as uh, legitimate, even if they disagree with it, um, I, I think you have a, a viable um, a political rule uh, to follow. And we were very fortunate in that there was no anti-constitutional party that came out of the founding, unlike, say, in France or in many other countries that had revolutions and, um, you know, con foundings, constitution writing um, moments. Um, but I would say that that's, it isn't, you know, it is, a, it is um, um, in keeping with the, the theory of the people who founded the country um, uh, that the, um, the operations of consent uh, were, were directed and consent was gathered in the process of, um, you know, uh, which went on and not, it wasn't, you know, a one shot deal. It was a, a series of continuing um, uh, resolutions and decisions over the course, you know, <clears throat> from at least 1774 or 1775, you know, um, all the way up to 1788 to 89 and even slightly longer. So, it may be reasonable to say consent happens in stages over time rather than all at once. That said, to the extent that there's supposed to be unanimity anywhere along this, the process here, uh, I still fail to see exactly where the unanimity occurred. Maybe you might say unanimity isn't really necessary, but from what you just said, it seems like it is necessary, at least at some stage. Yes. Well, it, uh, it is the, um, you know, it's, um, uh, uh, practically, of course, <laughs> there, 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 I don't think there's ever unanimity per se. There was a, uni I mean, it, it, the Federalist makes much of the fact that the um, decision of the <clears throat> Philadelphia Convention was unanimous in the sense that nobody who opposed the new constitution stayed around. <laughs> they all left. And so the only people left were, they all signed it. Uh, Actually, and that there was, were three who refused to sign. Uh, but the, but it was practically uh, unanimity there, and and Except there was a the vigorous debate about <laughs> yeah a vigorous debate about um, what that meant, of course, and what had been agreed to in the ratification uh, in the ratification process. But I don't. Um, um, uh, one of the interesting things about the founding, it seems to me, is that we haven't really studied it much as a founding. I mean, if you looked upon it from the point of view of, of you know, Platonic or Aristotelian accounts of founding, or just in general, classical accounts of founding, where you get usually the, you know, the densest and the most interesting such accounts, um, a very important part of the founding of the American Republic would be the expulsion of loyalists and the, uh, uh, from, uh, during the war, um, the fact that uh, the, you know, when, as a very old man, Thomas Jefferson reflects 
on what the, you know, on the 50th anniversary, the upcoming 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, um, he sends a letter to the uh, mayor of Washington, D.C., explaining he can't come in person on the 50th anniversary. He's too old and, and, and infirm. But he includes a paragraph to be read aloud, basically, from his letter uh, to the crowds in Washington. And he says, in, in, in explaining what the meaning of the Declaration of Independence was, that all American Whigs thought, <laughs> <laughs> thought alike on these questions. But what happened to the American Tories? And, yeah. and the answer is they were basically excluded from the political community. Yeah. And that is, but that is, a, you know, that is the beginning of founding. Um, if you, if, you know, in Aristotle's account or Plato's account, it, one of the earliest stages of founding is trying to have as many friends of the regime in the regime as possible and as few enemies of the regime in the regime. So we awesome. could probably talk the rest of the time about the theory of consent, which I've written about in some of my own work. It does seem to me the consent seems like kind of fraudulent if it's uh, the consent of all the people who are left after we've expelled all those who refuse to consent or otherwise coerce them into quote unquote consenting. And similarly, even at the Constitutional Convention, which you mentioned, uh, I, I teach at George Mason University. George Mason was one of the three members of the Constitutional of course, Convention yes, right. who at the end refused to sign and gave a detailed speech about why he thought the Constitution, to be sure, the as yet unamended Constitution was a terrible right. idea. So right. at, at some level, therefore, he, he did not consent. Um, but I know there's a lot more to your book, and we, I think it would be interesting to the audience to talk also about your view of the progressive constitution as well as the original constitution. So in the book, uh, I think it's maybe a bit of an oversimplification, but it seems like you divide the development of the progressive constitution into three waves with the progressives, then later perhaps the New Deal and Great Society, and uh, finally the sort of modern, uh, what might be called multiculturalist left. So I wonder if you could talk a little about those three waves, what you think their significance is, uh, what of them, uh, you know, obviously you reject a lot of their views that they have. So what is it that you don't like about their, their views? <laughs> right, well, um, I, I use this uh, formula of the three waves of liberalism in my, in my book. And um, as you say, there are, the three waves are correspond to progressivism at the beginning of the 20th century, the New Deal, and then the, the Great Society. And it's, a, it's, much unti it's very untidy in the 60s, of course. It, it's not just um, Lyndon Johnson and the administration that is of interest, but also the new left. Um, and the relation between the Johnson left and the new left becomes very interesting and complicated and, and has a lot, I think, of uh, relevance for what happened to the left after um, the 1960s. But I would say, um, if, if you looking at the three waves, this is um, what seems to me salient uh, about them. So the first wave um, represented a, um, uh, a, a new political science, essentially, a, a critique of the, of the assumptions of the older political science, that there's such a thing as a natural individual uh, who has rights um, that cannot be um, uh, violated um, uh, morally, um, that uh, he has the right uh, to consent to government, and the government has the duty to protect his rights, his life, liberty, property, and uh, pursuit of happiness and, uh, and, and other uh, rights based in nature, though, of course, many of them develop then into civil rights, um, which have the protection of law and of legal process. Um, all of those assumptions, um, someone like Woodrow Wilson would reject as uh, fantastical. Um, there never was a social contract. There never were individuals wandering around who were, um, um, uh, uh, you know, isolated from larger groups of human beings, from society. Um, there were no rights by nature. Um, all the rights we have, we have created. Uh, man has created in 
history, in, uh, in politics, in social um, groups. And th that argument um, pointed towards the living constitution as a new way to understand what a just political order has to be like. Um, it has to um, be based up, up upon the, um, um, the groups uh, that, that actually compose the body politic um, and the rights of those groups, which are in fact generated by the body politic. Um, we, uh, there was a rather unequivocal embrace of the notion of group rights as the basis of real human rights. Um, and the position of the early progressives was that uh, our rights don't come from nature or, or from God or from some source outside of our own will, but precisely from our own will working itself out um, in history. We're the author, human beings are the author of human rights. And there's really nothing above us that um, uh, colors those rights or um, uh, you know, attaches to those rights and gives them a certain um, binding authority and meaning. Um, and therefore, the government itself ought to be, uh, you know, one could understand <clears throat> if human rights were permanent features of human nature, why you'd want a constitution that was also fairly permanent, because you're defending the same human rights, essentially, all the time, rights that are essential to human nature. But if human rights are constantly changing, if they're evolving, with uh, society and with the economy and so forth, um, then you want a government that is not as permanent as possible, but as flexible and changeable as possible. And that's the living constitution is a Darwinian notion that uh, just as in, in biology, a successful organism has to change to, in order to survive, um, so also in politics uh, and in morals. Um, and that and the notion of leadership are the two great innovations, you could say, of the first wave of American liberalism, modern American liberalism. Um, leadership, uh, I'll say something about just very briefly. Uh, we now speak of leaders all the time. This is a very common term to use in American politics. You can't run for dog catcher without displaying your leadership credentials. You know, I, I'm a real leader. Um, but um, the founders um, understood that leadership was a necessary part of politics, but also a dangerous part of politics because leaders imply followers. You can't be a leader unless you have people who follow you. And it's not necessarily the healthiest thing in the world to have a country of self-governing citizens who want to follow someone um, or some cause or some party um, rather than governing themselves, thinking of how they ought to govern themselves in a, in a more um, um, egalitarian and libertarian way. Um, and, but we have as an inheritance the notion that presidents especially ought to be very strong leaders and that their job is to get the government moving uh, into the future and progressing and uh, evolving. And that the job of Congress and the rest of the government is, um, well, let's say the, the Congress is to follow the executive as he pioneers, as he pushes forward into, uh, into history. That's, uh, that's essentially Wilson and uh, to a large extent, Teddy Roosevelt's notion of what a president should be. And it's, it's um, unfortunately, I think uh, we've caught that bug and, and that's the way we think about presidents um, anymore. The second wave, uh, to make, to, to go a little bit faster, the second wave is <clears throat> the New Deal. Um, and uh, of all the innovations, and there were many, of course, in the New Deal, the one that I, I focused on is the change in the na nature of rights. Um, 
you know, would, uh, FDR called for a second Bill of Rights, um, and he had a series of of uh, amendments, or at least of, of mock amendments, that would establish this new second Bill of Rights. And among them, among these new rights, are a right to health care, a right to a job, um, a right to unemployment insurance if you lose the job, a right to a vacation from the job, um, a right to a good education, many, many things which in and of themselves may be perfectly respectable, but um, no one would have considered them to be um, rights in the strong sense before. Uh, and what FDR did in, in a stroke of political genius really was to take these, <clears throat> these new collective goods um, and turn them into individual rights that you as a, an American are henceforth going to have a right to health care. Um, and that is a, constitu a great constitutional innovation and we've been living under it or with it um, ever since. And then uh, it, it, flashing forward finally to the 60s, um, one, one finds both a sort of completion of the welfare state, um, a completion or, uh, in the great society of, uh, uh, of what um, FDR had been uh, attempting in, in the New Deal, um, but also <clears throat> one finds um, a new and more radical turn in the left, of course, um, which is not, which is of course located on the on the new left, on the anti-Vietnam War left, uh, on the um, 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 but not confined, let's say, to that left. It, it spreads rapidly into the mainstream uh, of the Democratic Party too. And here, uh, another kind of new right emerges. I mean, which is essentially a right to. Um, um, uh, what we would now call identitarian um, politics. Um, it, it, these are rights defined by, uh, in part by lifestyle, by sexual preference, uh, by um, uh, gender uh, consciousness and things like that, as, but, uh, as well as environmental rights and a whole suite of rights that um, are thought to um, be necessary for um, um, the, for a good quality of American life. Uh, Arthur Schlesinger's formulation, I think, is pretty good. Um, he said that the uh, 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 New Deal liberalism was really quantitative liberalism about finding a, a, a sort of floor un, a, 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 of a standard of living that no one could fall beneath for uh, every American. Um, but that in the 60s, liberalism became interested in qualitative questions uh, of the good life, of, the, of uh, a, a good inner moral life, a good relation with nature, a, a, a good sex life, you know, all of these things which suddenly became questions of right <clears throat> um, which somehow the government had a responsibility for. Um, and that's, that's the third wave of liberalism. In, and we're still more or less in, in that third wave, I think. We're living with the, the uh, um, contradictions and the complications of that third wave. Um, Barack Obama was um, in many ways, a, 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 a Lyndon Johnson, you know, they're very different human beings. <clears throat> in many ways, an LBJ style, um, a combination of, of LBJ and the new left. I mean, he, would, uh, he was in a way, Obama was in a way, a kind of fusion of the two sides um, of that third wave. So um, that's, those are the three waves of liberalism, which have washed over us. And each one has changed our politics enormously. Um, and so if you look back over a hundred years at the progress of liberalism, you'll see how different American politics is than it was in the 19th century. Um, and you'll see how the conservative resistance to these liberal waves has been um, um, uh, less than 
successful. Um, I mean, there have been some important successes along the way, but essentially um, the modern conservative movement didn't really come on the scene in American politics in a strong way until the end of the 20th century. You know, uh, you could say that uh, Ronald Reagan's election in 1980 was the first major triumph of the conservative movement. Uh, maybe Gingrich's success in 1994 in, in ending 40 years of democratic control of the House of Representatives, an unprecedentedly long period, um, it is also an important moment, but that's 1980 and 1994. The century is virtually over, um, and which is why I call the 20th century the liberal century. It's really the century that American liberalism uh, moved in and took over American politics in many respects. Okay, so I think that's a, a good and interesting survey. I guess I, I wanted to ask you then near the end about your take on the development of conservatism to which also a large part of the book is, is devoted. But I'll ask this one more question about liberalism, which right. is sure. uh, on the one hand, there's sort of a duality in your book. And on the one hand, you clearly don't like any of the three waves all that much. You have a lot of problems with them, but there's also the sense that we saw earlier in the interview that you think a lot of the changes they've made either can't be undone, or at least it would be un uh, unwise to try to undo it. So how much, if any of the three waves of liberalism, would you try to undo or would you think is desirable to try to get rid of? Well, I think the, um, you know, if you go, if you, <laughs> it's impossible, of course, simply to go back. But if one could go back to um, the, uh, you know, the liberalism that was prevailing in American politics at the beginning of the 1960s, let's say, um, that was um, not a radical uh, stage of liberalism. And if you could return to a more quantitative um, liberalism, if you concern more, if you were really uh, focusing concern upon, um, um, uh, you know, uh, income questions and uh, how to, in fact, um, improve matters for poor uh, white families and black families and families of all colors in the United States. I think that is a, um, uh, could, could provide the basis of a kind of, of, um, of compromise or at least of a, a cooling off uh, period in our politics. But instead, um, you know, the, our politics is, is very much driven by the creation of new kinds of rights on the, so to speak, qualitative side, on the, the um, um, uh, moral, moralistic side, you could even say, uh, of our politics. Um, and so our politics is, is now about, uh, you know, transgender um, issues. Um, it's also about practical matters like COVID, and, uh, and, and what to do about the COVID um, you know, uh, virus and the vaccine uh, and so forth. Uh, and, and, and there is probably, again, more space for compromise in those common sense and quantitative questions than in the qualitative questions. Um, but we're, you know, we can, it, it's very interesting that and especially I think the left and right are guilty of this, but the left much more so. I mean, when, uh, when you become um, obsessed with um, pulling down the statues of, of Abraham Lincoln and George Washington um, and, of, uh, 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 create, and of staging a purge essentially of American history, uh, and and a purge of uh, uh, of American um, monuments, uh, you know that is a that's a way of saying this. We want a kind of revolution. We want new statues of new people representing new um, principles, and that takes you in a direction that is very hard to uh, agree to disagree about. So depending on how I interpret what you just said and also analogous statements in the book, uh, 
It could be you have very deep and profound differences with the left, which you know have led to a sort of crisis, but it could also be that if you're willing to accept all the quantitative stuff and just object to uh, certain identitarian politics and pulling down of statues and so forth, it may be that sort of 90 or even 95% of the actual activities of government that have resulted from these three waves, you might be willing to, if not endorse, and at least say, well, it's not such a big deal, you can live with it. Um, so obviously readers of your book have to decide for, for themselves what, you know, how they, right. they feel about that. Um, uh, but I do in a few minutes we have left want to uh, query you about your view of the right in particular about a couple aspects. One is you mentioned the identitarian politics of the left as it has emerged. Is there not also an identitarian politics of the right, both uh, in terms of saying, as you at one point note in the book, that many people on the right have this view increasingly that the U.S. is not in fact about principles of natural rights for the constitution, but rather about a particular ethno-national identity, whether it could be called white Protestant or Anglo-Protestant or Christian. And similarly, a lot of the rhetoric of Donald Trump, and not just the rhetoric, but his policies on immigration, trade, government spending, and other issues, do you seem to be based on this kind of uh, sort of identitarian nationalist vision of the real Americans versus recent immigrants versus certain kinds of elites and so forth. Uh, and this is sort of familiar from European right-wing nationalism in France, Germany, and other countries. So is there an identitarian turn on the right as well? If so, are you worried about it? Um, you know, what, what would you think should be done about it? Yes, I mean, I think there's an identitarian temptation uh, on the right. And I, I would worry, I do worry about that because it isn't, um, uh, it, it isn't the case that, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is a, um, um, a, a prudent and, uh, and reasonable position. It is, a, uh, it is a reaction to a position that the left has taken. Um, it is a, uh, you know, you can't have... Um, Identita identitarian politics for everyone except uh, American whites. Um, you know, if you're going to have identitarian politics, every identity um, is going to have a right to that kind of ethno-nationalist or whatever you want to call it, um, politics. And I think it's a mistake. It's a mistake for the right to go down that road, as it was a mistake for the left to go down that road. And the only the only solution is to turn around and go back uh, in the in the right direction. Um, and I, I, Trump himself is an interesting um, case because uh, you know he never called himself a populist. And uh, uh, political scientists have wasted a lot of ink writing about uh, about him as an a, as a populist or as an authoritarian populist. He never really called himself that. And I don't think he thought of himself in quite those terms. He did call himself a nationalist once or twice. Um, and of course, that's a, a nationalist is, is, is an is a old American political term. Um, it, it just depends on whether we're talking about what kind of nation we're talking about. And America always understood itself to be uh, an exceptional nation. Um, not that it was... Um, immune to all of the political problems that every other nation um, uh, suffered because it was not. And Hamilton and uh, um, Madison uh, understood that very well in the Federalist Papers. Exceptionalism means you're free to be exceptional, uh, but it doesn't mean that <laughs> every aspect of your life is going to turn out, um, you know, happily. Um, as an exception to the normal rules of, um, of politics. But it does mean that, you know, for America, uh, natural rights and, uh, and the assumptions of equality and liberty that uh, go along with natural rights were fundamental to our notion of citizenship. Um, you didn't have to, there was no, um, uh, you know, American religion there was no American um, um, uh, ethnicity um, as such. 
um, you were f America was a very uh, open-minded um, country in which uh, it attracted immigrants from all over the world. Um, it also had slaves, of course, um, but the contradiction between the voluntariness of, of our citizenship uh, and the involuntariness of our labor relations on the plantations uh, was obvious to um, everyone um, in American politics for a very long time. And I think the the Constitution is underrated as an anti-slavery document. And one of the great things about the historiography of, um, uh, of the Constitution and of the first uh, you know, 75 or so years of American national political life recently is that um, that anti-slavery story is emerging uh, in a clearer and clearer way despite the 1619 project and its attempt to emphasize the other part or the other, uh, the other view um, of those facts. We only have about a minute left. I don't, hopefully I will be allowed to ask one last question. You mentioned earlier the notion of an anti-constitutional party and mentioned how sort of progressive tendencies in that direction. Do you see a tendency of that in the right as well? In the book, you say Trump is not a Caesar figure and he may be well not have the abilities that Caesar has or the skills, but I think you wrote the book before the events of January 6th and before Trump's reaction to the election and not just his reaction, but that of much of the Republican party where they rejected the peaceful transition of power. There were a good many of them who uh, either supported or excused the violence of January 6th. So is that just an aberration? Is that uh, showing more deeper anti-constitutional tendencies on the right? Or is it just simply something that's unique to Trump that will go away? What is your perspective on that and how it fits into your larger thesis? Uh, uh, well, I've just written a, a long essay on this uh, question for the Claremont Review of Books, um, in which I take the p position that um, um, Trump's speech on January the 6th did not, did not incite um, insurrection. If you actually look at the speech um, and its context, it seems to me that um, it fails. Uh, it fails that the incitement test. However, it was reckless to hold a mass rally on January sixth, the day in which the Congress is was constitutionally handed the job <clears throat> of counting um, the electoral votes and of you know providing a. Uh, and ne a necessary constitutional step in the election of the president. Um, that was a, an offense against the constitutional order, or at least it, it was the, the root of an offense against the constitutional order. Um, uh, it was reckless of, of him to do that. It was reckless, secondly, to send the crowd down Pennsylvania Avenue with really no preparations made to handle it at the other end, uh, you know, at Capitol Hill. Um, I don't think he intended it to be a, uh, an insurrection. I think he was calling for peaceful protest and for what he talked about mostly, uh, well, uh, he, oh, not mostly, but what he talked about a great deal in the speech was primarying the weak, what he called the weak Republicans who were voting against him on the impeachment question and on the electoral count um, question. Uh, as it were. So I think he had in mind a regular political process, but he was playing with fire, no doubt about it. Um, and he ought to have prepared, uh, look, I, I, was, I was prepared to give him every legal recourse uh, in appealing the, uh, the result of the uh, election in, in the particular states that he was uh, concerned about. But when none of the legal um, appeals, um, uh, you know, uh, proved effective, um, at some point, it seemed to me he ought to have, um, obviously, um, conceded the election. And, uh, you know, it, maybe he, he didn't have to say it was fair, but it was done. Uh, and it was now a, a governing uh, our politics, and he was leaving the White House, and a new president was coming in, and he could continue to protest the fairness of the election till doomsday. 
um, if he would like, but he had to he had to concede and he had to leave, and he did, of course, in the end. Uh, but he did it in such a way as to um, as to disgrace many of his, I think, um, good achievements as a president. The good pol- he, he had um, a record of very good policies in many respects, not all respects, but in many respects. Um, so that I was, <clears throat> um, I was shocked at the turn um, that he took. Uh, I still don't think it made him a Caesar figure, but I do think it really, it, it, uh, it uh, discredited his achievements. So thanks so much for a fascinating discussion. Um, Almost any of the big issues we've talked about are ones that we could spend a lot more time, uh, but we have to leave it there. Uh, I urge uh, interested viewers to uh, check out your book so that they could uh, get more of a sense of your thought on many of these matters there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elia. It's been a pleasure. For me as well. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org.